And uh, I now have pleasure to introduce Dr. Chris Elliott. Uh, he's had a distinguished career in aerospace and defense systems before qualifying as a barrister, specializing in regulated technology. And Chris is a fellow of this academy and is one of the founders of Lehman Micro Devices, a Lausanne-based company developing technology for monitoring health. The company is prototyping a device that accurately measures all five vitals and that is small and cheap enough to be built into every mobile phone. Chris will be talking about how devices like these, together with the internet, will help patients become consumers with profound effects on the delivery of health care globally. So Chris Henry, thank you very much. One of the benefits of being the last speaker is that everybody's done all the work for me. So I turned up here with three pages of notes and I've torn up most of them, so I've rewritten the whole thing. I want to talk about one technology that links into what you've been hearing all afternoon, which I think has the capacity to make a qualitative change in the way that the, the medical enterprise, the medicine as a whole, works. Um, and I'm going to link it in with almost everything you've heard today, I think. Let me start off with an analogy, and it's not original because Professor Yang used exactly the same one, about computing. When I was a student in the 1970s, computers were mainframes. They were tended by high priests. Uh, it, when, in Cambridge, it was big news when our computer got another megabyte, one megabyte. Then we had mini computers like the PDP-8. Now, they were still expensive, but they could be used by trained specialists, not just the high priests. Then we got the PC and the Mac, and suddenly everybody could use them, but they still need to learn spells and tricks before they worked. Now we've got cell phones and iPads. My kids download apps and run them. There's been a huge change. The, project, the, the whole use of computers has been de-skilled. And another thing that's happened, there's 10,000 megabytes in that one, as opposed to the one that Cambridge had for all of its residents. It's a massive change. Now, Echoing um, Professor Yang's point, on, on that spectrum, I feel that the medical enterprise as a whole, not just robotics, the medical enterprise as a whole, is somewhere around the mini-computer. It's not gone very far down that spectrum. If it did, what might happen? And again, let's just look back at the computing analogy. One thing that's happened is prices have tumbled by Moore's law, orders of magnitude. The players have changed between every generation. Very few companies make it from one generation to the next. A few have. Apple and Microsoft are struggling to, to stay in touch. Samsung's displacing them. It changes every time. But one thing that has changed that's counterintuitive is that the need for experts has grown. We need more programmers, more IT specialists now than we did, but they're doing a different job. They're now, they're not hacking code, they're, they're, they're facing the customers. They're dealing with strategic problems. They're helping people exploit the technology. So, I mean, it seems to me that one thing the medical enterprise has to face is, a, is if this technology rolls through what they do, I always have to say we do since we're, we're between us on both sides, is it ready for patients who turn into consumers? Very different behavior. Um, if you ask most people in the world three questions. Question one, what's the most important thing to you? Most people would say my health. Question two, what fraction of your disposable income do you spend on electronics? I posed it as, as fraction because even in the developing countries you're talking about, people spend a lot on mobile phones as a fraction of their income. The answer is we spend a lot on electronics. Question three, what fraction of that is spent on your electronics for your health? Zero. Just about zero everywhere. So again, there's a, there's, a, there's a potential revolution if the medical electronics community takes up what's happened in consumer worlds. If suddenly we become consumers, what's going to happen? Well, let me show you something. That's, first of all, something that's coming now. You may have seen this. This is the, the, a device called the Scanadu Scout. Uh, it's it's um, in, just about to be launched. I mean, they've done all the, the razzmatazz. Quite a clever trick. It's, it's being sold at $150 for beta test. Now, that's a bit like the lab rats paying for the privilege of running through the maze. It's a very clever commercial trick. Um, it's starting a revolution, and it, it's some words from my company's pitch to our investors, which, which Professor Norton just used. A revolution where you move from low-volume high-cost to high-volume low-cost. 
It's not got there yet. It's still $150 for the privilege of being the rat. Uh, it doesn't measure very much. It doesn't do it very accurately, but it does it. And it's got wireless comms to your smartphone. And the, the strap line for the company is you can check your vital signs as easy as your email. Um, I'm not sure that's actually true. I mean, it's, it's a limited accuracy. It's too expensive for a casual purchase or for, or for the market that Professor Norton was talking about. It's not personal. It's, it's a piece of kit that you can connect to a phone. It's not always with me. I mean, I don't know if any of you have bought dongles or add-ons for your phone, but, but I never have them with me. And it's certainly not as easy as checking your email because you've got to wire it up or, in, or interface it in some way. Um, but that's a big step, and it's, it's happening now. Um, let me show you something that's coming next. And now, unashamedly, this is the commercial because this is my company. This is something we've got working in the lab. Uh, we haven't yet got it into a phone. That's a year or two away. But the lab results are very encouraging. We're developing a sensor that's small enough and cheap enough that it's built into every cell phone, just like the camera or the, 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 uh, the sensors detect tilt or the GPS receiver. Um, it measures all the basic vital signs, including blood pressure. I, I wasn't going to do a technical talk today, but for those of you who say, how do you do that? It's essentially the classic occlusion method, Riva Rocci, but instead of using a cuff, we simply press against that artery on the side of the finger. Um, for all sorts of reasons that I'd be happy to talk about over a cup of tea, or better still, a glass of wine later on, it, it, it has the potential to be substantially more accurate. We can measure diastolic blood pressure reliably. Not many of the techniques can. There's no cuff. There's no pump. It's low cost. We can knock that out for a few dollars. We can knock it out for the same sort of price as the components of the built-in here already. Um, it's medical accuracy, as good as the ISO standards. It's so cheap that uh, you can build it into the phone, so it's always with you. It uses all of the phone infrastructure. You don't need a separate battery or power supply or any of that. It's all built in. And it's personalized. It's my phone. That's mine. It's always with me. So if it's got my sensor in, it's got my data and my history, it's personalized for me. You know, one of the correction factors actually is how tall you are. Well, it, I can put that in. Um, as I say, we, we, we've got it working on the bench. We've uh, got clinical trials scheduled for later this year and a sh first production batch during 2014, looking for quantity afterwards. And when I say quantity, um, just to give you an idea of the sort of quantities that people talk about, at the moment there are 10 million, roughly 10 million blood pressure monitors sold globally every year. We started talking to cell phone companies and one of them, they understand we're still early development, so they just want to know a sort of planning figure for what sort of cost this might be to them. So they came back and said, can you give us a budgetary figure for 100 million? Now, that is 10 times the global sales of blood pressure monitors now. And that's the first inquiry. That, that's why I think that this is, is, is game changing. Um, and, and right now I'm going off piece because I did have notes for up to now, but I'm going to be making up as I go along from here on. Um, one of the things that strikes me is the leverage you get in those countries that have fewer than the normal, the, the Western number of doctors, the leverage of actually having these things around, because most people, most say most villages have got a cell phone, a lot of individuals have. Um, how can that multiply the effectiveness of the doctor? We've got to do, we, we the community have to do a lot of work to avoid flooding them with the worried well. But if we give them the right information, this is what you're talking about, we can suddenly increase the, the productivity of those few doctors. Um, there's a bit of model about what difference it makes, and I, I'm interested to hear what, what it would be like in the less developed countries, but I looked at some statistics for the states, looking at the, the extent of undiagnosed hypertension, and following up with that, how many people are undiagnosed, how many people, um, if they are diagnosed, get treatment, and how effective is the treatment. And uh, if, we get, if we get to this model that we hope we get to, where you wouldn't think of buying a decent phone without one of these, just as you wouldn't buy one without a camera. So everybody gets one. And we all like gadgets. We'll play with it. We'll diagnose ourselves. Uh, the, the model I've got reckons that for every 1,000 phones we sell, we save 65 qualities. Assuming it's about a factor of 50% quality, we're talking about 130 life years for every 1,000 phones we sell. Now, that's in the Western world, where Hypertension is probably more common, but is better diagnosed. I guess that we, if you play off those two numbers, you get a similar result in, in the rest of the world. 
Um, there's also some interesting things that once you start getting hundreds of millions of people logging their data every day, what's the research potential of that database? Uh, and that's something that, and our, our, it's interesting, our cardiology advisor who works with the company um, is more interested in that than, than anything else, that what could he do with the research that will come out from people constantly making these measurements, even in fairly under controlled conditions. So, I mean, that, that's the sort of thing that's happening when you take the technology that made this iPhone and apply it to medical devices. High volume, low cost, stamp them out. Um, we've got several other concepts in the pipeline, which we've, you know, we've got as far as applying for the patents we haven't yet developed. And I know several other companies have also got some pretty radical ideas, knocking things out for a few dollars that do things that currently cost hundreds. Um, and that takes the whole of the medical community into the consumer community. Interesting, I, I looked up the etymology of the word patient. It, is, it has the same root as the word patience. Consumers aren't patient. They want it now, they want it cheaply, they want it in my pocket. Now, is, is the medical world ready for dealing with hundreds of millions of people who treat medical diagnosis like other things? If you look at over generations, I mean, my parents defer to the nice doctor. My, my mother was incensed when her GP said, well, I've got two possible treatments you can have. Which one do you think you should have? She was furious. I'm paying, you know, her message was that you're paid to tell me what I'm going to have. Now, if you look at our generation generally, we, we do our research on the web. When we turn up at the doctor, we've, got, we've done some homework. We'll challenge the doctor. We will possibly change the doctor if we don't like them. But um, no, we don't like what they say and do. But the next generation has gone a step beyond that. I mean, they, they expect everything. They expect their banking, the entertainment, communications, on demand, whenever they look for it. Uh, they pay for technology to do that. They're going to expect medicine to be delivered as just another service, like banking, um, delivered through their personal technology. So. I, I was, I'm skip up all the other things I was going to say because I think that was the, really, the big message I wanted to deliver, linking into all the, the things that have been said today, that if you take this consumer revolution that's happened in personal electronics and roll it across to the medical enterprise, the knock-on consequences are enormous. And I mean, my question, if you like, for the medics among you is, you know, are, are you ready for it? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Uh, we should be able to get you together with the venture capitalist on the table and maybe do a deal before the afternoon side. Um, but now we've got Andrew back on the platform, Robin and uh, Chris Elliott, and the uh, floor is now <coughs> for questions. Gentlemen with the glasses and the fine striped tie. Uh, Brendan Clark, uh, Society of Um, just a, a comment uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Tashenko was saying earlier, perhaps I was very fortunate that I actually published in the Lancet as an engineer in 1969. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe it's a uh, Really a question for uh, Dr. Elsie, really. Um, you, you did say that the challenge uh, perhaps was the medical profession, not engineering. And I'm reminded of a telephone conversation I had many years ago with the Chief Engineer of the Department of Health, whom I rang up simply to ask him, well, how many uh, operating theatres do you think you have in the National Health Service? My dear chap, he said, I don't know how many hospitals we have in the National Health Service. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my question is, that with all this finance um, going to, or, to, to the design and manufacture of uh, all these innovative things, is it more difficult or less difficult to get them implemented in the National Health Service as it perhaps is in some other countries Andrew, do you want to take that? Um, yes, I mean, it's a very good question and very apposite um, at, at the moment. I think, I think what we have in, in the UK is, is the potential to actually lead all countries in Europe and, and actually North America as well in terms of the adoption of these technologies because of this theoretical 
conglomerate we have called the NHS, um, if we can just harness it, um, it's a very fragmented beast, the NHS, and um, not always particularly well aligned amongst all its constituent bodies. Um, but there are a number of initiatives going on at the moment which are attempting to overcome that, uh, overcome those barriers of adoption. Um, and I think if those can be made to work, um, there is the potential to actually use the sort of uniformity, if you like, of, of, of the NHS and the ability to, to, to suck up innovation <coughs> from certain you know, centres of excellence and to push it back out into the sort of cold face, if you like. Um, if we can get that right, then we can start to really illustrate the power of new technologies um, sooner than most other markets which don't have that homogeneity. Any other comments from the table? Perhaps I'll just make a comment. I know frugal innovation, my discussion was on emerging economies, but quite frankly with the huge costs of the US health system and indeed the UK health system, Arguably, there's a lot of opportunity for frugal innovation that could be implemented within the NHS because <coughs> cost is a huge issue. Issue. Chris is vigorously shaking his head. No, I, I was just thinking to endorse that. T two statistics that I found: that the, the U.S., which is thought to have a fairly aggressive military stance, spends 3.5 percent of its GDP on the military and 16 percent on health, despite getting a very bad outcome. And there are roughly 1.5 million people a year declare personal ban bankruptcy in America. 60% of them as a result of medical bills. Yes, sir. Councilman from Newcastle and maybe on Smart Pen with you. There's a very good book come out recently called God Bless the NHS. And in, I think it's in the first chapter, the author addresses the question about who owns your health and who owns your health? And he comes to the conclusion that the only satisfactory answer to that question is you. And that, of course, fits, I think, alongside Chris's mobile phone devices and so on. But I'd just like to ask the question, and I think Robin would be interested as well, about whether that concept of owning your own health, buying a mobile phone device to measure important variables, is compatible with a socialised universal healthcare system. Hmm. I, I suppose it was implicit in what I was suggesting, the revolution that comes, that uh, whether we like it or not, consumer technology means we're taking ownership of all sorts of things. I mean, I, I think you know, our relationship with our banks, for example, has changed hugely. It used to be that you, you went humbly to your bank manager to do anything. Now you expect everything online. So I, I think it's an inevitable change that we are going to take possession, and the technology is going to help us. I think again, it's one of those things that's up to the health industry, the health, the health enterprise, I call it, to adapt its offering to recognise that that's how people want to behave. The same as they have for everything else that they now expect to get over the internet, information, services, all the rest. So I think that's just just restating the challenge. The technology is going to lay down the challenge that people even will want to rise to it. Perhaps if I could offer um, an example from some of the work we've been doing. We, uh, our team have been looking at um, working, have developed an app called Food Switch, which are individuals, consumers can use in supermarkets, and they, they scan the barcodes of those foods and they provide consumers with information about the salt content of those products. And with a traffic-like system, tell consumers whether it's high, low, or medium salt content, but also says, well, there's another product in the row that gives you exactly what you want with a lower salt content. This app was released in Australia, where it was developed first, and has had over 350,000 downloads already, and was top of the free apps list in Australia for quite some time. Now, our, our team had taken that model and are now using it for patients with celiac disease, so they can look at whether they're gluten-free products or not. And next week, it has been launched in the UK. So I would anticipate that that 350,000 download in Australia will be multiplied many times in the UK. 
One last comment I'd make on that, which again shows you the consumer approach to this. The teams said to people, look, if you go into the supermarket and can't find that product on our, our app, take a photo and send it to us on your phone. They were inundated with people crowdsourcing behaviour. Individuals provided that information and sent that through to them. Now they're working in India with a data management group who, who, are, who are looking at um, uploading all of that information. But it, it really does show you the power that I think consumers want to take control of their health with simple devices like so, mobile so I'd phones. I'd like to come back on that because um, I was going to give another example. I think that's, a, that's exactly the sort of thing. I've got on there one of the heart rate monitor apps, the one that uses the, uh, the camera and the flashlight. Put your finger on it, it just takes the red box, made by Zoomio. Last time I checked, there had been 25 million downloads. People wow. want to do it. So that's now going to blind you because I was demonstrating it. <laughs> Andrew, from a business perspective, yes. how do you see all this? Um, well, I can't wait for that app, celiac app to come out. My son's got celiac disease. So I'll be the first one downloading it and using it, I'm sure. Um, and I, I'm, a, I'm passionate about the sorts of things we're hearing about in terms of um, the sort of consumerization and getting the power in the patient's hand and all these apps and so on. Um, <clears throat> I think I find myself slightly um, in a balanced position, though, uh, in, a, as a partial skeptic. Um, and that is, I think, it's the inevitability, absolutely. Uh, the timing, um, I don't think, is going to be quite as uh, precipitative as the as we've seen in previous uh, disruptive models um, in the consumer and retail oriented. And the reason for that is that those consumer models, it's a very simple relationship between the end purchaser and the, uh, and, the, and the provider of the service. It's a straightforward, I benefit, I pay, and therefore the model can quickly shift. Um, one, of the, one of the issues is in the healthcare system is that you have a regulatory um, uh, barrier and you also have a misalignment between uh, beneficiary, payer, and provider. And, and so that misalignment, um, coupled with cultural issue, you know, um, conservatism in the profession and all, a whole range of other things, are there as big barriers to that sort of change. So I think in those areas where patients really can make the choice, and the Celiac um, app is a great example, where actually that's more of a consumer app. It's I go into the supermarket, I buy some food for my Celiac um, uh, relative uh, or myself, <coughs> I make the decision, I get the benefit. Um, as soon as there are multiple stakeholders and the payer is, is someone different and there's a regulatory hurdle, um, it just becomes a bit more complex. Inevitability, yes, it'll get there, but I, I, I think there are lots of things holding back the rate of change of that disruption uh, because it's not, it's not a straightforward consumer um, market. Professor John, and the lady with the glasses after that. <coughs> Thank you. Andrew and Georgia, presentation. And, and, and pick up on the point you made, I think, which is an opportunity and perhaps a degree of optimism about the European regulatory environment that we see in terms of encouraging global companies to come here. Uh, could I ask you a question related to that? Do you think that is going to help Europe and the UK in terms of future investment in product development and manufacturing in, in devices? Or indeed, can that regulatory environment become more beneficial to encourage growth? Um, I, I certainly think we need to use it, we can use it better and more proactively to differentiate ourselves from the US. My concern is that actually we are, there's, the, there's a danger of actually heading down more of the US route, which is looking to tighten up even further, and there is talk of uh, becoming more US-like in the way we, we regulate devices. Um, and that to me would just be a great shame, because it just, it just takes away that that advantage. Um, but I think we can do more with it. I, I don't know whether lightening up that regulatory pathway is, is actually the way, or actually it's more about what we were hearing earlier um, about the, you know, the, the approach to regulation. It's just doing it a bit cleverer um, and, and using other industries to draw on. I think we probably can do that to make it less burdensome. Um, but it's not, it's not a bad approach we have at the moment. But I think we can do more to attract investment to this, to, to Europe. Uh, into clusters um, uh, um, and bring in, you know, just make it as smooth as possible, bring in really good regulatory advice, advisors, share on everyone's experience and just make it a, 
uh, a cluster, if you like, on this side of the Atlantic, which really helps people get to early market, which they can't do in the US quite so easily. Can I just add something? Oh, sorry. I just read something about the, the, the development of the European regulatory environment. I mean, the, the reaction to the, uh, the hip breast implant scandal, completely irrationally, yeah. since actually it wasn't the regulatory mechanism that failed, it, it, was, it was dishonesty. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was fraud. But the reaction has been certainly from the European Parliament to propose a much more FDA-like structure. And it's interesting that the European medical device community, the, 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 med, the trade association, is lobbying against that on a slogan that's something like don't cost don't cost three years health because their central point is in Europe we get the benefit of medical device innovation three years earlier than the Americans on average because the regulatory system is, is so much more effective so I, would, I agree I wouldn't suggest lightening it but the danger is that the political knee-jerk reaction closing the door after the, you know, the stable door after the horse is bolted is actually going to make it worse yeah. and that's something that uh, the industry is very aware of Robin, did you want to add anything at this? No, fine. And then there's the lady on the glasses here. Hello, can I just ask a question, please? Um, I'm someone from MHRA. Just a very quick question. Um, Sorry? Uh, where is the lady? Yes, uh, please, you go ahead. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I missed the, the, the um, what you were talking about. The, the, the X Prize. Keep the so, microphone uh, close to in, your. In light of in light of the uh, the X Prize for the tricorder that um, that is, is uh, has recently come around. Right. Um, you know, should we be uh, investing money into prizes uh, to encourage innovation in this kind of technology? Do, should I kick off one? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Well, let me let me say it now that. You might think that what my company is doing is right in the mainstream of the X Prize and indeed the Nokia Prize for the same sort of thing. We have not entered either of them. Um, I, they are, I think, well designed. If you are the research department of a major company in a totally different field, they're actually quite a good thing to do because if you've got some sort of corporate venturing internal money, they may well be quite a good way of publicizing it. But for us, as a, as a startup company, we are, on, and just as Andrew was explaining, we're going down that series of investors. We started off with personal money. We've now got a bunch of angels and we've got the first couple of million. We should be coming to you in a year's time. Uh, and we, we don't have time to play games with prizes like that. They're too small. The, the, the Nokia one's worth about 25,000 if we win it. You know, that's a week for us. Um, so that's one, that's one reason. The other is, I mean, the, the, the more developed one is, is the, America, the, the Qualcomm sponsor, the XPRIZE. And although they've recently done some quite careful footwork to try to pretend it's different, it was posed in terms of the original Star Trek, Bones carrying his box. It was a device for the doctor. And the, 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 the revolution that, that I'm trying to say I think is happening is, is not devices for doctors, it's devices for people, for consumers. And the X Prize was conceived around something for the doctor, not personalised. I mean, part of the specification, it's got to be able to diagnose, I think, 25 different people. Well, my, my whole point was, no, that's my phone. As long as it monitors me, I'm happy. So I think the, the, the X Prize was ill-conceived, um, but at least a reasonable amount of money. The Nokia one is too small. And they don't actually change the game from what Andrew was talking about, which is the, the traditional way in which you finance new companies. Robin, would you... Well, I, coming from my perspective on things, I and perhaps that's the academic world, I see there's lots of smart young people out there who have got great ideas and think outside the box, mm -hmm. particularly in low and middle income countries. 
So being able to offer them an opportunity to take their ideas to the next stage is a great idea. We have explored that, but also recognise as a need, it's not just to provide people with money, but to provide them with incubation labs, if you like, to work with people who can assist them. And I think that's where we've, in a sense, stopped from going to that next step um, with the idea of a prize, because a prize without the infrastructure to take it to the next step is probably yeah. a waste of of, of people's time and energy. So I'd love lots of money, but it would need to be money not just for the prize, but for the infrastructure to support the follow through and sustainability. Yeah. Well, it's right out of my mouth. Um, all for prizes, um, <clears throat> but it's the platform which they provide and the incubation and the assistance. I, I mentor on a, on a, a platform called Healthbox. Uh, which has come over from the US, um, started by Sandbox Industries, big um, VC in the US, and it's all about digital health, and they've set up over here, and they've got a small fund, a five million fund, and they have a prize around it, they have incubation facilities, and they have an enormous mentor network, which they, they pull in to help these little companies um, start on those initial few steps to commercialization. Um, and they then open up their investor network from, uh, you know, who's, who's behind that fund, and so on, and so, it's just about opening that door and widening it. And if a prize is the pinnacle of that, that uh, the effort, then fine. But the pinnacle on its own is, is not really worth the money it's, uh, it's printed on. And I think be slightly skeptical about Qualcomm and people like that. that um, when they set up a prize, they're looking uh, at, this, at this as a cheap way of finding potential technologies to go and invest in themselves. It's origin origination uh, exercise for, from their perspective. This time, the University of Glasgow. I was just in a very interesting talk a couple of weeks ago by a North American orthopedic surgeon, Canadian in fact, comparing getting an implant into use in, the UK, in Europe and North America, saying that in Europe, you look and see how it behaves, assess its competence, assess whether it's able to improve something, and then use it. In America, they check it's safe, use it and then work out whether it's better or worse than any of the others. And he was suggesting actually develop the European system where you assess whether it's actually improving compared to previous technology is more effective. And in fact, we kept using implants in Europe much longer than we've got the surgeon's skill developed. Whereas America, oh, I've done 20 of those, it's now time to try a new implant. Um, Would you like to go for that, Andrew? So, I, I mean, I think if, if I understand what you're saying, the, um, the concept of uh, looking at evidence for improvement um, in, in function, uh, not just safety, is, um, is a European approach. And, and it's increasingly coming in, certainly. Um, and, you know, the use of the fourth hurdle, if you like, um, in this country, um, NICE and... Uh, you know, it, it is definitely coming both in, in medical devices but also in pharma. Um, and I think, it is, it, I think it is a reasonable approach in medical devices. I think it's not just about being safe. But having said that, you know, there is the, the sort of CE mark type approach. It depends what type of device we're talking about. Um, where, um, you know, it's a light regulatory approach or it's a, it's a, um, you know, a low class um, FDA 510K type approach. Um, where, you know, it's just... All, all it's doing is showing comparative to something which is already out there. I think that's also a, you know, a sensible approach. We, you know, just because we bring out a new invention doesn't mean we have to then go and prove its efficacy if you can show it's, you know, um, it's, it's similar to something that's already out there from a safety perspective. Let's let, the, let's let the clinicians start using it and see whether they think it actually is going to improve outcomes. So I, I think um, in some areas and some types of devices, it's important to show efficacy. Um, and I think the orthopedic implant is one. Uh, but in lots of devices, um, quite often just more external devices, um, monitoring type devices, um, then it's going to be important for your commercial model, absolutely. But from a regulatory perspective, I, I would caution against having um, certainly too much uh, onus around having to prove clinically um, uh, the, the efficacy uh, just to get it onto the market.